So I'll go into full screen here and I'll say hello. Thanks very much for having me here for this year Games 2020. And my name's Kieran Nolan. I'm a lecturer and researcher at Dundalk Institute of Technology in Ireland. And the title of my talk today is Jam Arcade. So I'm going to look at the association of that name. I'm going to look at the hardware standard and talk a little bit about what's the aesthetic of a JAMA game. So table of contents, it's a very short table of contents. So kind of described in title already, but basically, yeah, we'll look at the organization. We'll look at the JAMA standard as a machine to machine interface and a aesthetic constrainer. And then I'll take a look at the main part of this talk will be a timeline of the development of the JAMA arcade standard in 1985, and then wrap it up with a summary and some conclusions. So a little bit about the organization formerly known as JAMA. It was originally set up in 1981, and the acronym stood for Japan Amusement Machinery Manufacturers Association. So it was set up as an industry rights group back then. And in 1989, however, it expanded its role to become a trade organization. And, oh, something's happened there. So then in 2012, the organization, the acronym changed as when it incorporated the Japan SC Amusement Association and the All Japan Amusement Park Association. And the acronym changed at that point to stand for Japan Amusement Machine and Marketing Association. So I guess it's just important to point out while the focus of my talk and I guess the research I've been doing the last few years has been about JAMA standard and JAMA era arcade video games, the JAMA organization themselves, they represent the interests of the Japanese amusement industry as a whole. So just not not just the video game side of it, but all sorts of coin-operated amusements. And then in 2018, JAMA underwent another evolution. So it merged with the All Japan Amusement Faculty Business Association. And from then on, was known as JAIA, the Japan Amusement Industry Association. So the JAMA organization in 1985, they brought out, they got together and they decided on a standard system for connecting game PCB boards into arcade machines that would be adhered to by the different members. So it's a type of interface that's a machine to machine interface that connects one part of the machine to another. So yeah, it was developed in 1985 by the JAMA organization and a little bit of technical spec for it. So it was a standardized 56 pin edge connector 28 double-sided um, pins with a spacing of 0.156 inches and mail on the game board. So the, the actual boards themselves, they vary greatly. There's no set kind of computational side to them, but that wiring standard is set. And the machine itself, it supplies the power and player inputs, the, the monitor itself and the speakers. And there's a baseline monitor standard for these cabinets and it's 240 lines of video and RGB video and the refresh rate is 15 kilohertz so basically what you've got is quite a low resolution video and while you have in the last decade and like new JAMA era or new JAMA standard arcade games and they'll say yeah we're a JAMA arcade game and it's there's no set kind of limit on the technology but at the same time this the control method and the baseline video video standard it does affect the look and feel and also you'll find that developers making modern JAMA games they'll try and stick to the type of visual effects and tools or the equivalent of the tools that were used back in from mid 80s to late 90s so for example you wouldn't have an overuse of graphical filters graphics would be made pixel by pixel rather than using kind of modern transitions and effects. So yeah, and as far as the control system goes, the baseline is two joysticks and three action buttons per player, two start buttons and two coin inputs. Now, we all know of games that have more than three action buttons. So for example, there's a Street Fighter series and that's done through a kick harness. So basically they had an extra connector directly on the board that those controls were wired to. And 
the jam as standard because it's quite, you know, it's, it's, it's quite Spartan. There's a lot of, it's limited, but at the same time, it also allows a lot of modifications and a lot of different workarounds. But the actual the design of this standard, oh yeah, something I meant to mention, is that it is indeed, it's a family of computational platforms. So like I said, like this was implement, brought in in 1985. Um, I would define the JAMA era as from the mid 1980s to the late 1990s to that point where home computers and consoles sort of reached a, a level of parity with what was available in the arcade as far as audio visuals went. So the actual hardware continues to evolve, but the, they always have to stay within those set constraints I've mentioned. And while the picture is on screen here, this is a test board used for arcade games. It's a really rudimentary game that was just shipped with some arcade units just so that they had something to test out. And it is a monochrome maze game. The name just escapes me at the minute, but it uses a Z80 processor. So that's the same chip you had inside a ZX Spectrum. It was from 1990, so it's quite late. So very low cost, but also a nice, neat example for the, video, for the picture. So a week um, timeline of the actual development of the JAMA standard. So on the 15th of October 1985, the JAMA standards conference for TV game machine boards was held. And that took place at the TVR building in Nagata Cho, Tokyo. And the aim of it was reducing the burden on the operator and also with a view to enhancing electrical safety. So this burden, part of this burden was that up until the introduction of the JAMA standard, while different manufacturers might have had their own standard edge connector for switching games. They didn't, there was not at that point or prior to this, a universal industry standard. So the JAMA, so the 1985 JAMA standard, it was brought in to address this. And also, again, it was, this standard connector would also be helpful for health and safety and for, for their own stand, for their own protocols and their own, um, their own rules about what was a, what were the electrical standards for arcade games. So for example, um, one of the issues that the JAMA standard had to come up against was RF interference. So basically they found that some games at some point made by some of their manufacturers were causing radio interference. So again, this kind of shared electrical standard was important to them as it would you know, help the industry and stop any kind of issues for their for their members. Now, okay, so during this conference, the PCB JAMA Standards Technical Committee was established and it was chaired by Tetsu Fukuda of Data East and the vice chair was Michihiro Saito from Taito. And the team included technical staff from Data East, Namco, Capcom, Sega, IRM, Taito, and Nihon Busan. So it was quite a wide representation of the who's who of, of the arcade industry in Japan at that time. And the committee, they set about finding a solution, as I said, to unify their edge connectors, board size, screen display, the screen display and the direction of that screen display and input output signals and other parts of that technical spec. So there were three meetings that followed that on the 29th of October, the 7th of November, and the 14th of November in 1985. And at those three meetings, the JAMA Standards Technical Committee got together and worked on the, the engineering of this standard. And then on the 21st of, of November, it's quite a quick turnaround. They had the second standardization conference. And during this meeting, they agreed on what the standardized parts and materials for JAMA standard edge connectors and PC boards would be. They also agreed on what the JAMA logo and the placement of this logo and the accompanying te technical documentation. This was followed by a meeting on the 26th of November, 985, and that's when the JAMA standard was officially established uh, back at the TBR building in Tokyo. And so it was established at that date and they decided that they would implement it officially from January the 1st, 1986. And also a nice detail from the archives of Game Machine magazine was that they decided that the label for JAMA standard products would be five yen per sheet. 
So the Game Machine archives have been invaluable in putting together this timeline. At the very beginning of the talk, I mentioned how the organization had restructured. It also moved a number of times. So at the early stages of my research, I contacted JAMA and you know, asked them, do you have any, any details about the, the, the JAMA standard? And they said, unfortunately, that those documents had been lost and that because of not only the organizational change, but because they'd moved physical office as well. And I guess it's because it's pre-internet era, era and not a lot of stuff was digitized. This is, this is very understandable. But in the, um, the Internet Archives, an amazing resource, I used the Wayback Machine to grab all, all the old revisions of the JAMA.org website back to 97. And in it, there is a technical document for what was the sequel to the JAMA arcade standard called JVS. So that was JAMA Video System. But in that, they have this timeline. So that shows the JAMA, JAMA video system underwent a couple of different revisions. So they have, as part of their document about the second revision, this, this small timeline. And you can see there's JVS step one, JVS step two. So those are the different JAMA video system. But then they also have JS. So the original JAMA standards, you can see here that they have that same date marked in as of the 11th or the 26th of November, 1985. So that matches, and that was actually got hold of that before the Game Machine archives. And yeah, so on the 1st of January 1986, the JAMA standard was brought into force, and they used Game Machine Archive to have extensive coverage of it, including the technical diagrams. And yeah, Japan. JAMA President Masaya Nakamura outlined the advantages of the new standard in his 1986 New Year message. So he said, as you know, the current video game distribution is dominated by board sales and game software is consumed quickly. So users are frequently replacing boards. If the standard of the board to be shipped is unified with the cooperation of each manufacturer, the advantage on the operator side will be greatly expanded and the operation of the electrical appliance and material law will also be positive. So it helps the arcade manufacturer, it helps the arcade operator, and also helps with the adhering to electrical safety laws. I can see here, this was the two page spread that had the full technical details for the JAMA standard. And again, like 980, this is well, the beginning of 1986, so we're pre-internet, and this trade publication was an excellent way to reach all members of the, of the JAM organization and also arcade operators and those with interests in the, in the industry. And on the left, what you have is the, what, this, there's a table, and it shows the wiring diagram for the 56-pin connector, and then on the right, alongside other details, and on the right, then, we have the um, technical diagrams that describe the edge, the edge connector, the placement of the buttons. On the bottom left, it shows the placement of the buttons on a cocktail style table arcade. And we also have the diagram of the JAMA logo and how that's to be shown. So yeah, here's a slightly zoomed in image of that. And we can see the detail there. So some nice old school hand-drawn technical drawing going on there. And excellent detail that could be used to, to replicate it. Now, so in summary, a few points. So, yep, the JAMA standard was introduced by the, or the JAM, Japan Amusement Machine Manufacturers Association as a pragmatic move to ensure the survival and continued growth of the arcade industry. The organization, they worked really efficiently and they were engineered and had this standard rolled out within less than three months. Although it's worth noting that there was, it didn't just instantly kick in. It was some of their members were using non-standard hardware up until 1987, including Capcom. But eventually it, it rolled over into common use. So it's a common architecture as far as connectivity options go, but it greatly varies in terms of its memory, processing, and audiovisual spec specs. Also, as mentioned earlier, Jam Arcade games aren't a single platform, but a family of platform and their look and feel is in part shaped by the display 
and control constraints of the JAMA hardware standard. And as I said, people who are building modern games that are done for JAMA hardware will often try and replicate the pixel art styles of the mid 1980s, late 1990s. And yeah, three decades on since this invention, the JAM Arcade standard continues to survive, resisting competing standards, including its own evolutionary augmentations in the form of JAMA Plus. So JAMA Plus would be the likes of the extra wiring that I mentioned for Street Fighter and also unofficial reconfigurations of the, of the 56 pin connector and also then the JAMA VS, the JAMA video system. So it's a little bit of like the way that um, while we're in the streaming era now, we still have DVDs on, are typically much easier to get hold of than Blu-rays because the DVD players are ubiquitous and they were good enough and served the purposes for, for many. So this stuck around. So like JVS, you could maybe say is like Blu-ray, JAM is like DVD. And yeah, that's it. So the JAM organization, it's renamed, it's now the JAIA, but the JAMA standard, it lives on. And I think that's it. I have one final slide to so just say thank you very much. And if you want to read a bit more about my research in this area, you can check out the whole thesis if you want, or just the chapter with that part. It's at this link. And I've zoomed in by accident. There's my email and Twitter. So if you want, you can get in contact with me either of those ways. Or of course, I'm very happy to answer your questions now. Thanks very much, folks. Thank you very much, Kieran.